If you've contemplated getting into tube audio, whether it be speaker amps or headphone amps, or maybe you've contemplated doing some DIY and you haven't been sure if you're up for the challenge of soldering, then what I've got here today might just be the right product for you. Sitting here next to me is the Red Roo SE5 amplifier, and it's both a tube speaker amp and a tube headphone amp. But what makes this one really unique is that you can buy it as either a regular DIY kit where you assemble it and solder it all yourself, or you can buy it as what's called a solderless kit. And that means it's going to come essentially pre-assembled, a bit like a flat pack. And what you're then going to do is take out the parts, screw them all together, and then away you go. So you do save a bit of money whichever way you go compared to buying a pre-made amp, and the end result means that you've had a bit of a hand in putting it together, whether it be a complete build including soldering or just an assembly process. Of course, none of this would be relevant if it doesn't sound any good, so let's jump in and take a look at the Red Roo SE5, how easy or hard it is to build, how it sounds, how it compares to other products, what sort of speakers and headphones it can drive. There's lots and lots to cover, so let's jump in and check it out. The first thing I should tell you is that the Red Roo SE5 is an Australian made product, but it will ship internationally. So everything I'm about to tell you, you can buy this and use it in your own country, wherever that might be. I don't know if they ship to every single country, but it is definitely able to go outside of Australia. And part of that comes down to the power supply, which I'll talk about soon. But to kick things off, let's just put this into context and let you know that it's a 1,289 Australian dollar headphone amp. And that means it's going to come in at around about, depending on exchange rates, about 860 US dollars. That's the price for the regular kit design, meaning that you're going to do all the soldering and assembly yourself. If you want to do the solderless version, you're going to add about 190 Australian dollars, which probably equates to about 140 US dollars off the top of my head. And so it's going to come in at around about 1000 US dollars or about 1500 Australian dollars. Now you can also choose to buy it without the tubes to save you some money, but the tubes it comes with are quite good and I would recommend buying it with tubes to get you started unless you've already got some of the tubes on hand and I'll talk about what the tubes are in a moment. There's a fair bit to cover with the SE5 because there's lots of different variations and tweaks and settings and versatility to it, but it is very simple which is great, you can do all these things very easily. And so let's start with a quick run through of some of the key features and functions and bits and pieces about the amp. The first thing to know is that this can be run in three different modes. So this can be an ultra linear amp, it can be a single ended triode amp, or it can be a pentode amp. Now if none of that makes any sense to you, don't worry too much about it. The key thing is that you can relatively easily choose how to set this one up, and that's just by changing the connections of some wires into some different screw terminals. It's not particularly hard, a little bit fiddly. And in doing so, what you'll be doing is driving the tubes differently, and that can result in different sorts of power, a slightly different distortion characteristic, which can therefore alter the coloration of the sound. And so you've got three different flavors of amplifier should you choose to try them out. I've really only focused on the amplifier in single-ended triode and ultra-linear mode. I'll discuss the comparison between the sound of each when we get to that in the sound quality section. But the good news is you can tweak and play with this very easily, and again, without the need to understand soldering if you don't want to. Moving beyond those modes, the other things to tell you about is that this is a transformer coupled amplifier, so you don't have some of the issues that you might have with an OTL amp or an output transformless amp. This has two output transformers under these two, they're not exactly bells but similar to bells here. And that means that this amplifier will happily drive your 4 ohm, 6 ohm, 8 ohm speakers, but also headphones of all different impedances as well. Producing the sound and the power from the amp, we've got a pair of 12 AT7s at the front. This is the same family as the 12 AU7. The 12 AT7 has a bit more gain than the 12 AU7, but you can interchange them if you want to, if you need to reduce gain, although I don't think you would on this one. And then the power tubes behind the 12 AT7s is a pair of EL34s. 
and there are a few other variants of the EL34s that you can roll through this one, but at the same time, it's not a hugely versatile tube rolling amp, such as the Elekit TU8200R that I've covered on the channel before. And so if you're looking for real tube rolling fun, you may want to go a different direction, but there are definitely a few good options, and the EL34 family is quite large. So there's plenty of choices there. You just can't get into the wide range of different models with the SE5 like you can with something like the 8200R. All of what we've talked about so far combines to create an amplifier that can put out 5 watts continuous or RMS into a 4 or 8 ohm load for speakers, and that's running in the ultra linear mode. So it is at its most powerful as I understand it in ultra linear mode. You will be dropping back a little bit if you're running it in single ended triode mode. But what I've found with the SE5 is that with that sort of power, you're going to be able to comfortably drive speakers in the realm of 88 plus decibel sensitivity, even those that drop a little bit lower. So I think the Harbeth P3 ESR XD that I reviewed recently, that dropped a bit lower and the SE5 just managed to drive those. That was in single ended triode mode. I haven't tried them again in ultra linear, but that little bit of extra power might make all the difference there. And so the key thing is you're going to drive efficient speakers very comfortably with the SE5 and most headphones too. I say most because there is a catch with the noise floor and we'll get to that shortly. I know I'm teasing lots of things here, but I just want to give you the sense of all the different ground we're going to cover. While we're still talking about the design and features of the amp, let me do a quick tour because that's going to cover off a couple of key points. And the few things you need to know here is that the amplifier is, as I said before, both a headphone and a speaker amp. So you've got a headphone socket at the front, which will mute the speaker outputs at the back. We've got a power switch as well. Then we've got our volume control, all obvious things so far. And then things start to get interesting. Over here, we've got our input switch. Now that's nothing special in the fact that it's got option one and two. We've got a pair of RCAs on the back. So sorry, that's actually two pairs of RCAs on the back. You've got input one and input two, but then we've also got Bluetooth. And so the SE5 is also a Bluetooth enabled tube amp. What that means is you could have this set up on a bench somewhere in your house with a pair of compact speakers, and you could stream your music from your smartphone to the Bluetooth module within the SE5, and you've got yourself an all-in-one tube-based streaming solution, essentially. Now, I'm saying streaming from a smartphone or some other Bluetooth source in the house, but the point is you've got no other wires or anything attached to this. So I do love the versatility that that brings, and it's a lovely way to get tube-based sound in a home without a whole lot of other sources stacked up around your speaker amp and your speakers. If we then roll around to the back of the amplifier, on the back of the amp here, I've already mentioned we've got two pairs of RCAs. These are inputs. You've got a separate ground connection should you need it for ground loops and earthing, etc. There is also a 3.5 mil jack. So if you do want to run an auxiliary lead from a smartphone, a dongle, some other device with 3.5, you can, instead of using the RCAs for input two, just use the 3.5. And then next to that, we've got a couple of switches. And this is another area that the SE5 gets quite interesting. And that's because what you've got in the first switch here is the feedback circuit switch. So you can run this as an amplifier with no feedback, or you can run it as an amplifier with feedback. And that's kind of cool. When we get to the sound quality section, I'll talk about what the feedback is doing, how it's affecting the sound and altering the sound. But it's really nice that you can play with that and just again, tweak the sound to your liking. Moving on from that switch, we've then got our impedance switch for our speakers. You can choose between four to six ohm and eight to 16 ohm outputs. That's just gonna help match the output of the amplifier to the speakers that you're running. Then we've got our speaker terminals. So you've got screw terminals here with banana plug or tube plug connectors, or of course your regular binding post type connectors. And then finally, we've got our input for our power. Now I mentioned the power supply before is a key factor in this running globally or internationally. And that's because what you're gonna be feeding in here is a DC connection. And therefore what that then allows us to have, or more to the point allows Red Roo to have, is that they can then provide you with a power brick that's going to work on any voltage, 110 through to 240 volts. The power brick you get looks like this. It's a fairly hefty beast. It looks like a power supply you'd normally see with a laptop. But as I said before, it's rated for 100 through to 240 volts, which means it's going to work in the US, in Europe, in Australia, in Asia, anywhere at all. So you can buy this, run it anywhere at all, and you're just then feeding DC into the amp. Now, theoretically, you could also run a linear power supply should you want to, but be aware that the SE5 is going to draw a fair bit of current. I think it's rated at somewhere up around seven amps. So there's not a lot of linear power supplies that pump out that sort of current. You might need to get a custom made one. And so I haven't tested it with linear power supplies and I can't tell you if it makes any difference at all. Before we jump into sound, we should talk about the assembly of the SE5. And I've done lots of different DIY kits before, mostly the bottle head kits, but also the Elekit TU8200R. And so when Phil offered to send me the solderless version of this kit, partly because I've done lots of DIY, I know what it's like, I do enjoy it, but also I know how little time I have at the moment. 
when he offered me the solderless kit, I jumped at it and said yes, because I really wanted to experience just how easy a DIY kit could potentially be. And I've got both good and bad news. The good news is there's no soldering involved. So if soldering is the thing that holds you back from doing DIY, this is the solution. But the double-edged sword of that is also that it's not a completely simple kit. It's not quite as easy as I alluded to before with the idea of an Ikea type flat pack. There's a little bit more to do in here. You do have to connect a few wires up with simple screw terminals. Some of the assembly of the chassis and the circuit board within the chassis is a bit fiddly. Whilst it does make it a bit more complex having to fiddle around getting the chassis together and the circuit board in place, what that also means though is that there's a sense of accomplishment when you do get it all together and it's up and running. I wouldn't say it's as strong a sense of accomplishment as with say a bottle head kit or the 8200R, but you can still look at the finished product and know that you've sort of built it with your own hands. Specifically what is involved in the assembly is you're going to get a pre-built circuit board That's going to go inside the chassis and get screwed into place with some spaces. You're then going to also have to attach, and I might be getting the order of these things wrong, you're then going to attach the two output transformers and screw those to the chassis. You also have to connect up a few wires, and they're just a simple case of putting a wire into a screw terminal and tightening up the screws, so nothing too fancy there. You just have to follow the colouring and the instructions. And then after that, you're going to screw together the front plate, the back plate, There's a few little tiny bits and pieces of assembly with the switches and bits and pieces that go on the back of the back plate. And then the cover goes on underneath, the feet go on, and you've got yourself an amp. So it's a job that could easily be done in a few hours, one evening. As I said before, it's just a matter of following instructions, connecting some wires based on colouring and labelling, and having a screwdriver to do up the terminals. And then the end result is what you see in front of me here. If you buy the solderless version, it's all been pre-tested by Phil. And so you literally will just connect it all up, switch it on, and start enjoying your tunes. And speaking of that, let's talk about how they'll sound. And this is where things get complicated, because there's so many different ways to think about it. But there is one thing that's consistent across the board, and I want to cover it off straight away. That is that you are going to hear, depending on your speakers or your headphones, you are going to potentially hear a slight hum, regardless of how you set up the SE5. There is a very, very low-level hum that I heard consistently from the SE5. Now it's going to depend a lot on your speakers and how far you are from them. If you're not familiar with the channel and some of the reviews I've been doing recently, I've got a near field speaker set up here. So I can almost reach out and touch the speaker here and the speaker over here. And what that means is that if there is any noise through the system, I'm going to hear it because I'm right on top of the speakers. If this was set up in a living room or in more of a sort of normal listening setup with the speakers a bit further away, say on speaker stands, then I probably would never have heard that noise through the speakers. With headphones, it's a little bit different and it will depend on the headphone. But it's worth knowing if you're in a very near field type situation or you've got ridiculously sensitive speakers, you might hear a bit of hum. It's very low level. It doesn't influence what you can hear when the music's playing. It's only when the music's off. And it's such a low level that I really only noticed it when I switched the amplifier off because it's one of those very, very low level hums that tends to just blend in with the background sound of life. So don't get hung up on it, but at the same time, do know that it is there. Don't get a shock if you suddenly hear it. It's just part of what you often get when you buy a tube amp like this. Now, if you're thinking about using this amplifier with headphones, it could be an issue with headphones because obviously the drivers are right next to your ear. And so different headphones that I've tried do show up the hum a bit more than others. To give you a quick sense of that, things like the ZMF Caldera work fantastically. They're about a 60 odd ohm planar magnetic headphone. I had no issues with hum on those. The Mesa Elites are another headphone that worked beautifully. They were lower impedance, I think a 30 something ohm impedance planar magnetic. And from memory, I did hear a very slight hum with those. The HD660 S2, which is a 300 ohm headphone, that worked a treat with this as well. Not as good as maybe it can sound on a beautiful OTL amp. We've got that lovely high output impedance from an OTL amp matching up beautifully with the high impedance of the drivers within the HD660. But the SE5 still sounded lovely with it. Where things don't go so well is if you've got a very sensitive headphone, things like the Beyerdynamic DT900 or 700 Pro X, those are going to show up the hum from this one. And likewise, IEMs will as well. So if you've got very, very sensitive headphones, particularly sensitive dynamic drivers, for whatever reasons, the planers, even sensitive planers, don't seem to show it up as much. But the dynamic drivers definitely seem to show it to me. So something like those Beyerdynamic DT900 and 700 won't be a good fit. Pretty much anything else though, and you're really going to enjoy this amplifier, I think. Speaking of enjoying the amplifier, what you probably want to know now is how does it sound? 
And I'm going to start off talking about it in its single-ended triode mode. That was the mode that Phil, who designed this, recommended. Phil's obviously from Red Roo. He recommended that single-ended triode works really well on this one. And generally speaking, I do agree with him. And that's because, as you get with most single-ended triode designs, when you listen to the SE5 in single-ended triode mode, what you're going to hear is a lovely kind of tubey mid-range. And what I mean by that is not a thick or overly rich or warm mid-range, but a very smooth and liquid mid-range and a slight emphasis on mid-range. What a lot of SET amplifiers, SET being single-ended triode, what a lot of SET amplifiers can do is they seem to give a bit of bass roll off, either in terms of the actual frequency response or just in the way they control the drivers in the lower frequencies. They tend to pull some of the emphasis out of the bass and therefore give more emphasis to the mid-range. And that's definitely what I heard from the SE5 and it's a lovely sound. What that can also do is lend a beautiful sense of space in the soundstage because often having that little bit less bass can allow more of the spatial cues, more of the ambience of a recording to come forward. And so as you listen to the SE5, you are getting a lovely sense of imaging and soundstage size and space. It's an amplifier that, unlike some tube amps, is a bit more left-right than deep. Some tube amps throw this wonderful, really, really deep stage. I didn't find that so much with the SE5. It's not shallow, it's not a wall of sound, but it's also not throwing a huge amount of depth like some tube amps can. And so I describe the overall sound of the SE5 in SET mode as being a good quality tube amp at the price. It didn't blow my socks off, it didn't wow me in any particular way, but it's a good solid offering in a very compact package that's very easy to assemble and very well priced as a result of being a DIY kit. Moving on from general sound quality now, and let's talk about some specifics. And I want to start off with the feedback switch on the back that I mentioned before. Now, if you're not familiar with feedback, the way feedback works is with feedback off, obviously nothing's being done, the signal comes in, it gets amplified, and it gets spat out. If you're switching feedback on though, what's going to happen is the signal is going to be fed back on itself, hence feedback, and that's going to help us to cancel out any noise or distortion that's been introduced into the signal. Listening to the colours by Sneaky Sound System, and what I found as I switched on the feedback circuit and then switched it off again, was two things happened. First of all, it is going to reduce the volume when you put feedback on, because it reduces everything by 6 dB as it does that cancellation process. And so after a quick adjustment of the volume, what I then heard was that switching on the feedback just tightens the sound up a little bit. The top end with feedback on gets a bit crisper, and by top end I mean sort of treble frequencies get a bit crisper, a little bit sharper, and therefore with feedback off, they're a bit smoother and a bit more relaxed. Whether that's good or bad is going to come down to your system, your tastes, and the music you're listening to. But with the feedback on, things definitely get tighter in the treble and a bit sharper in the treble. Likewise, the bass gets a bit tighter, but also a bit less full. So feedback off is going to give you a slightly fuller bass, a slightly looser bass, not really loose and flabby and woolly, but it's just not quite as tight and punchy, but also a bit fuller as a result. I think feedback on, giving the tightness of sound that it does, also helps to improve the imaging and the focus. And so to summarise everything while listening to the colours by Sneaky Sound System, what I heard was that with feedback off, the treble was a bit smoother, a bit easier to listen to, the bass was a little bit fuller, but the imaging was maybe slightly reduced in quality. Turning feedback on made everything tighter, a bit sharper, a bit more defined, but it did come at the cost of a slightly lesser bass experience should you want that slightly more solid bass, more present bass. I should be clear that turning on feedback doesn't make the bass anemic, it just changes the character of it slightly. I also tried the feedback system on headphones because it works for the headphone output as well as for the speaker output, and what I found was that with a headphone like the HD660 S2, Having feedback off to me was slightly preferable. It reminded me a little bit more of connecting up the HD660 S2 to an OTL amp. It's a very different thing that's going on. Feedback is not changing the output impedance of the amplifier as far as I know. And it's definitely not turning it into an output transformerless amp. But having no feedback just gave it a bit more fluidity to the sound. And it is how I tended to prefer listening to headphones with the SE5. And so for me, the cool thing with the SE5 is that it's literally a flick of a switch to decide if you want feedback on or feedback off. You could change it based on your mood, you could change it based on your music, or you could just work out the first time you ever use it, which way you prefer it, and then just leave it set. So it's a really nice feature. I love the fact that it's been made switchable on the outside of the unit, and that for me is one selling feature of a few that the SE5 has going for it. Another key feature that it has that I've already talked about is the fact that you can switch between the SET, ultralinear, and pentode modes. 
Now, I said at the beginning that I haven't tested Pentode mode. I did a lot of playing around when I built the Elekit 2 8200R, and I never found that Pentode mode was in any way better for listening to music. If you're into tube amps for guitars, it might be a different story where you want different distortion characteristics. But for me, with tube-based headphone amps and speaker amps, I always tend to either like SET or ultralinear. So I stuck to that in the case of the SE5 testing. One reason for that, and a slight drawback of the way it's set up within the SE5, is that changing between the modes is quite fiddly. It's easy, but it's fiddly. What's involved is you have to take off the bottom plate of the amplifier, and that's not as simple as it sounds. You have to undo the back plate to be able to slide it out. As I said, it's fiddly. You've then got to take different wires and reconnect them in different configurations into some screw terminals. And so it does require pulling out the instruction manual, looking at the diagram, and making sure you match up the wires in the right order. As I said, not difficult, not complicated, but just fiddly. It also means there's quite a time delay between testing, and that always makes A-B testing of these sorts of things difficult. But the good news is that when I did make the change, it was absolutely clear which one I preferred. It was within the first few seconds of listening that I knew that I preferred ultra-linear when driving speakers with the SE5. Not so much with headphones, but definitely with speakers. Moving from the SAT mode, which I described earlier as having that lovely fluid kind of mid-range sound, a bit of focus in the mid-range, a little bit of roll-off in the bass and we're talking a little bit of roll off. Moving over to the ultra linear mode, and all of a sudden the amplifier had more authority. And I'm not talking about being able to drive louder, I'm talking about having more body and presence in the sound at any volume. What came along with that was less sense of that mid-range emphasis and presence that I described earlier. And overall the ultra linear sound was just more impressive. And sometimes a more impressive sound can mean a more fatiguing sound in the long run. What's initially exciting can sometimes become too much, but that's definitely not the case with the Red Roo SE5. For me, with the pair of Revel M105s that I've got sitting here at the moment, with those running on my desk, I just wanted to listen more and more and more in the ultralinear mode. Whereas SET was nice, it was solid, it's got a very sort of subtle appeal to it with that lovely kind of mid-range emphasis and fluidity, but it wasn't as consistently enjoyable across all different music as I felt ultralinear mode was. Now, by the way, all of this is with the stock tubes. Possibly if you do some tube rolling, different tubes might work better in different modes. And I'm going to have to leave that one for you to work out because there was way too much to cover in this review. To get into a lot of tube rolling and mode adjustments and finding synergies, that was a step too far for me on this one. I have got a quick tube rolling section coming up with just one other set of tubes. But the key thing for me is that I think this is absolutely at its best as a speaker amp in ultralinear mode. If you're listening to both speakers and headphones, I'd probably still err towards ultralinear mode. If you're buying it purely as a headphone amp, you probably want to try both because the SCT mode does have its benefits. It's got that beautiful mid-range emphasis and articulation and fluidity. So it's going to depend a lot on the headphones you're pairing it with and how you like your sound. The good news is you've got at least two modes to try. Both sound good and it's going to be a question of which one you like more. I just mentioned that I was using the Revel M105s as my speakers when testing the SE5. And it's worth picking up on that and just talking about the fact that I think this is a wonderful speaker amp for a pair of speakers like the M105s that maybe need a bit of extra character in their sound. The M105s are a nice speaker, but they're not a particularly characterful speaker. They're very kind of neutral, honest, unflavored in any way. And that's where adding a tube amp like the SE5 can be really lovely. With a speaker like the recently reviewed Harbeth P3 ESRXD, I felt like I needed the tube coloration less with those. They've got their own magnificent character through the sound, and so it's one of those where I think this is a great amp if you've got a pair of kind of somewhat neutral or boring speakers that you're looking to bring a bit of extra life to. Having said that, it's not an incredibly coloured amplifier, so you don't have to worry about making whatever you've got too thick or rich or muddy. It just brings a dash of flavour to a speaker like the M105 that just might need a little bit of help sometimes. By the way, the M105s are a nice speaker. I've got the review coming up for that one soon. Make sure you subscribe if you want to hear more on that. And if I've just made them sound dull and boring and lifeless, I don't think it's that black and white. There's a lot more to talk about them, so do check that one out when it comes live. Ultimately, as I've spent plenty of time listening to the SE5, I'd describe it as a really good solid speaker amp. I think I like it more as a speaker amp than a headphone amp. The headphone thing's more of a bonus that it can do that, but I'm not going to rave about it as a headphone amp. Certainly though, running it as a speaker amp with secondary duties as a headphone amp, I think it's really good for the price. It's not going to blow anyone away, I don't think, at least not compared to other amplifiers that might cost a little bit more and can do more, and I'll talk about one of those shortly. I think it's really good at the price, maybe a little bit above the price. It's very versatile. I love that it's got Bluetooth. 
but it also doesn't absolutely blow me away either. It's really good, really solid, a lovely entry into tube amps and or DIY, particularly the solderless idea if you need to do that. And so that's really where I see it excelling. Before I wrap things up there though, let's talk a little bit about the tube rolling and also a comparison to another amplifier that's also DIY. Starting off with tubes, I only had one pair of tubes handy that were a direct match for the SE5, and that was to swap out the stock JJ's EL34s for a pair of Mullard EL34s that I have here. Now these are brand new production Mullards made somewhere in Russia, they've just stolen the brand or bought the brand, I shouldn't say stolen, and so these are a new production, fairly affordable, $30, $40 tube, whatever they might be. And so starting off with the stock JJ tubes and listening to Heavy Hearted by the Jungle Giants, what I heard was a very clean and focused sound from the stock tubes. The vocal was excellent, very clean, very focused. The bass is solid, but not particularly deep. And by the way, I tried this on both full range headphones as well as the speakers because my little speakers have quite a bit of roll off in them. And so regardless of what I connected it up to, and this was all running in ultra linear mode now, Regardless of what I was connected up to, the bass isn't particularly deep or authoritative from the SE5, and that's pretty standard for tube amps. It's quite rare that on tube amps running tubes like these, you're going to get a really big, deep, meaty bass. That's generally the realm of the solid state amps, or maybe some more specific tube amps that are kind of better tailored for that. But everything else I was hearing from this was really, really enjoyable. The percussive elements of the track were very smooth, but still crisp, lots of detail. It's not a smooth or rich or thick amp by any stretch. I'd say it's actually quite neutral in terms of tube amps. And the other thing that really stood out to me was that separation of sounds, the sense of clarity, imaging, and as I said, separation was all excellent. You had a really great sense of where each sound was in the mix, and you could focus in on it, but it was all still very coherent too. Moving over to the mullards, and what I heard was slightly thicker mid-range from those... The sound was overall a bit fuller. Whether that's better or worse, I'm going to leave up to you. It's going to depend a lot on the speakers as well. And the mullards also delivered less crispness from the treble. Things are a bit smoother in the treble, a little bit less kind of defined in the treble, and that carried over to the separation and image focus too. So for me, I don't think the mullards were as good of a tube in the SE5. I really liked them in the Elegant 8200R, but they didn't suit this one as well. I think these stock tubes that come with the SE5 are actually a fantastic choice by Phil over at Red Roo because it allows the amp to have that wonderful sense of neutrality and clarity and cleanness, but obviously still being a tube amp, you're getting that nice little dash of just tubey magic. And what I mean by tubey magic is there's a liquidity to the sound, an ease, a fluidity, whatever terms you want to put to it. It's just an easier listen overall without sacrificing the tonality, not overly colouring the sound, but certainly giving it a bit of character. And so I was nearly ready to wrap things up here, but I do like to always give comparisons. The problem that I had here was a comparison to this amp is hard to find. If you're talking about sort of that 800 odd US dollar range, I don't have anything else here at the moment that really stacks up in terms of being a speaker amp and a headphone amp, being DIY of course, having Bluetooth... And this is really a nice way to highlight just how unique the SE5 is. For the price you're paying of sort of 800, 900 US dollars, depending on whether you buy it with tubes, solderless or soldered kit, etc. But for around about, let's say for less than a thousand US dollars, for less than a thousand US dollars, you're getting yourself an amplifier that's got Bluetooth capabilities, it's got multiple inputs, it can drive speakers, it can drive headphones, you can tube roll, you can change the mode through SET, ultra linear and pentode. There's just lots and lots of versatility and nothing else really stacks up. And so the nearest thing I had to this is another DIY kit in the Elekit TU8200R. Now for the 8200R, you're going to be spending about 400 Australian dollars more, which is going to equate to about 250 US dollars more, I think. It's going to depend partly on where you buy it from, of course, as well. And then where things get a bit tricky is that with my 8200R, it's also got upgraded output transformers that are going to add an extra 300 odd US dollars. So there were 500 or thereabouts Australian dollars, if I remember rightly. And so all of a sudden we're talking about a significant jump in price from the SE5 up to my setup of the TU 8200R. But that was the nearest thing I had that was comparable in the sense that it's DIY, it's a speaker amp, and it's a headphone amp. The headphone stage on the 8200R has some major issues. I'll let you check out my review on that one to understand what those issues are and how to get around them. And then the 8200R doesn't give you Bluetooth. It's also a bigger designed amp. It's much chunkier. But that also means you're getting a lot more power. I think it's about 25 watts RMS. So there's differences between them. They were just the nearest thing I could find. And so really what I was looking for in this comparison was to understand, is the SE5 punching well above its price point? Is it about right for its price point? I've already said it's very unique in terms of the feature set, 
but how does it go in terms of sound for money? Listening to 10th Avenue Breakdown by Supertramp, and I have to say it's not a particularly close contest. That's not a knock on the SE5 because the SE5 sounded fantastic, but the TU-8200R just immediately had more authority, it felt like it was controlling the sound better, there was more nuance to the sound. The sound was more holographic with wider staging, and what I mean by that was each individual sound in space was very clearly focused, a little bit better than the SE5, there was more depth and more space around everything, and it was generally just a really, really impressive sound from the 8200R. Again, I can't stress enough, that's not a knock on the SE5, because my 8200R is about $1,000 more expensive when you put all the pieces together that I've added to it, and that's the stock kit stuff that I've added to it, not my own mods. But the stock kit, plus the sort of pre-made output transformers designed to go with it, all of that means I've spent about $1,000 more, and so we're at double the price of the SE5. It should sound a lot better. The good news is, the SE5 is on the same continuum. What I mean by that is that the SE5 in its absolute stock form with its absolute stock tubes is getting very close to the 8200R. And I actually think that if I didn't have the output transformers, the upgraded ones that is, in the 8200R, it would have been a pretty close battle. You're still going to get more power out of the 8200R, but you're also going to get a slightly nerfed and not particularly good output stage for the headphones unless you're using high impedance models. And so I think it's kind of a wash and it leaves the SE5 looking pretty solid in my book. And so where I'm going to wrap all this up is that I think the SE5 doesn't redefine value. I think what it does do, though, is offer you something really unique at the price point. I can't think off the top of my head of any other product around about that sort of sort of 800 to 1,000 US dollar mark that's giving you tube amplification, the opportunity to go DIY if you want to, either soldering or solder less, the ability to tweak the sound to your liking with different modes, obviously some tube rolling options as well, and then throwing in Bluetooth streaming capabilities as well. It's a really interesting proposition. I think it's a cool looking amplifier in its own way. Some people will no doubt love the look, some people not so much, but I personally really like it. I think it's an amplifier that I'm going to recommend for people that want all those things that I've just talked about. If you're not going to use half of what it does, then maybe there's better options out there. But if you want to dip your toe in the water of DIY, maybe you're looking for a tube speaker amp, I wouldn't necessarily say buy this as a dedicated headphone amp. Great if you're going to do both headphones and speakers. But really where I see the strengths lying in the SE5 is if you're looking for a speaker amp and you also might occasionally use headphones. The headphone stage is fine, it just didn't set my world on fire. And so hopefully I've introduced you today to something new, something different, hopefully something intriguing for some of you. As always, I'll put links down below. There's no affiliations here. Anything that you buy through the link down below is not going to benefit the channel at all. But it's a great way to support a small company making, I think, a pretty innovative product. So if it sounds interesting to you, jump through the link down below, pick up an SE5 for yourself. If you've got one, or you're building one, or you've built one, then let me know in the comments down below how you found it, what you're enjoying it with in terms of speakers, headphones, etc. What mode you like it on, what tubes you're using it with. But for now, let's wrap things up. So again, as always, if you've enjoyed the video, if you found it useful, informative, I'd love it if you hit the like button. And please hit the subscribe button and ring the notification bell if you haven't already. But for now, let me leave it to the music. So happy listening, and I'll see you here next time on Passion for Sound. Music